بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is the third third or fourth the third the third uh, talk on the منازل السائرين of Sheikh Abdullah Ansari of Khawaja Abdullah Ansari a an 11th century, uh, 12th century sage who was born and uh, raised in what is now Herat. Uh, he was both an, uh, an alim, uh, a man of uh, knowledge of the outer, as well as one of the most realized masters of his time. And uh, for, for those who have not, who were not uh, who had not uh, had the occasion to uh, either read about him or to attend the first uh, two talks. Uh, I'll just go through a very uh, brief introduction so that uh, we can get into the, the heart of the matter, which is the, the third stage of the Manazil. The Manazil Sarin was uh, written by, uh, by the Khawaja, for his uh, adepts or uh, murids. It's meant for those who are relatively, uh, I'll say, advanced on the path, in the sense that they have uh, committed to the path of inner sight and uh, inner knowledge. And it was written for them in mind. So it is not so much a, a manual of achievement or realization, but rather a guide, a, an indicator of the stages, the hals or the ahwals, the states of a person who is on the way uh, to the Divine Presence. What are the various uh, states that he or she passes through? And these states are, you can think of them as a ladder or steps that go from uh, the most uh, elementary to the most realized and advanced. Uh, and he divided them into ten stages, ten manazil, each one with ten doors. So in total there are hundred uh, stages or above or doors. And these stages are uh, you should not think of them as rigid programs that go through uh, A to B to C to D, but they are basically uh, indicative of the various changes that go through a person as he or she passes uh, along this, this path. And before I, I uh, launched into these talks, uh, I wanted to, to make a, an observation. I think it's really quite important for those who uh, want to have some rigor and uh, discipline in their journey, inshallah, for uh, higher uh, degrees or higher conditions of inner sight. The, the Manazil were written at a time where, when I believe people were far more able to interact with the unseen with the, the subtler realms, the subtler lights than they are today. This is not a general uh, condemnation of modern times, but is really a, a statement of fact. We are far more immersed into what is uh, quantitative, what is physical, what is material, than we are in what is subtle, what is uh, m less easily uh, understood by your outer senses. And I think one of the reasons why this has happened, apart from the, the powerful engine of uh, modernity, which has basically uprooted the uh, human being from, from a condition of proximity and nearness in his or her daily life with the sacred. Uh, this has to be, in some ways, re recaptured. 
we have to recapture not only the outer forms of trying to connect with these inner realities, but what we have to also recapture the inner uh, faculties that I believe are there. They are innately there. They are part of Allah's uh, genetic blueprint, as it were. And it is these uh, faculties that have deteriorated and in some cases atrophied to the point where they are no longer uh, tangible, spiritually tangible, as it were. We have outer sight, we have touch, we have smell, but we don't have the opposite anymore. We don't have the faculties of khayal, which is the imaginary faculty that allows us to connect with what is not conceivable in material terms. We don't have the same degree of depth of the faculty of wahm, which is the ability to attribute value to things, the true value of things. We don't have the faculty of reflection where we reflect not on the outer forms, but on their inner meanings. Now, m- modern man generally has has lost a great deal of that, and I think any person who is embarking on this on this path of inner realization must do a great deal of preliminary work on himself and herself in order to be able to uh, benefit from these. Uh, uh, these programs, these spiritual programs. Many people I know have have spent years, if not decades, uh, attached to this, this, this path or that path, have done their outer rituals in a very uh, profound way and sometimes spiritually uplifting way. But there's no sustainability to it. There's no continuity to it. And it doesn't, your inner reality does not dominate your outer conduct. And I think for that to happen, we have to make a commitment to try to regain these latent faculties. And if they are there, I'm sure they're all there to some degree, uh, we have to uh, nurture them. So before I started the talks, I, I had, as it were, a, a pre-stage. The, the Khawaja talks about the, the ten menazil. I put another one, which I think is necessary if if, if you want to take advantage or uh, benefit from from these talks or from whatever course you may want to undertake that has some discipline and rigor to it. The the first step, I think, is to, to have a sense of unease, a sense of discomfort, a sense of agitation about your relation with the with the world or the universe of the more subtle elements we call the unseen. So I said this is the if you have that if you have that sense of unease that's very good. I think it's essential and it's something that you can build on. I call it the door of agitation for those of you who are Arabic or Farsi speaking or Buddhist speaking. It's the door of inziaj as it were. It's a sense of it's like having, as it were, a pebble in your shoe. You want to take it away. If you have that, that's a very good condition to have. That can lead you, I believe, to a condition of, uh, or a state of perplexity or hira, where you recognize that the outer world is, it is not sufficient. It is inadequate in terms of its ability to give you a total understanding of reality and truth. That opens another door. One door leads to the next. And I call that the door of uh, awareness or deraya or derayat, which is to recognize that you have within you this capability of uh, connecting with the subtle, subtler realities. If you don't feel you have that, that element inside you, it's very difficult to see how you can relate to the subtler world simply by its outer forms. And these outer forms include uh, 
manifestations of, of, of the unseen in its physical form, like the Quran, for example. That opens another door, which is the door of inquiry. And you ask yourself that this, this agitation that I have that has opened to me this sense of perplexity, where, it, where does it lead to? What is it all about? And here most people tend to read a lot. They tend to delve into books and into uh, various kinds of uh, religious works and so on. But I think it's more than that. This, this sense of inquiry, which is necessary, uh, is, is really to uh, verify that your inner experiences are true, that they are real, that they're not some fantasy, that they're not some kind of psychological state. Uh, spirituality, I must say, is at war with psychology. Psychology is, is the... Uh, sorry... Uh, I <laughs> said, <laughs> psychology, unless it has a spiritual dimension, cannot really open the door to the unseen, as I'm sure you would all agree. That gives you the next door, which is the door of Hidayah or guidance. You need to have somebody who, who knows more about this than you do. And this requires really that your, yourself, which is what, what you have built your entire uh, notion of being around has to be prepared to acknowledge that there are others who know more about this world than we do. And so on, I, went through, I go through the door of selection, that is, you have to choose a path. You, you, this is not really a menu, you can't really pick and choose here and there and try to eclectically put together uh, a workable package. You have, to, you have to make a commitment to a path. And that requires a commitment to at least the outer disciplines. There has to be rigor in this. I mean, w when we studied mathematics and or arithmetic, we all hated it. Or grammar, I can't imagine anything more boring than grammar. But you have to do it. There's a certain rigor to it. And, the, and especially if you are at the same time trying to build your inner awareness. And then I go into perseverance, Istadama. You need companionship. You need people who are like-minded, like-hearted. They can be from your family. They can be friends. But you need somebody that can mirror you. And once all these conditions are in place, then you have something, the beginning of not, not inner insight as such, but inner sight an ability to see things more in terms of their meaning than in terms of their outer form. This is, again, a very important quality, I believe, for those on any spiritual path, is that you have to have is an inner sight, something which is as truthful to you as your outer sight. And then the final stage is you have to go into siyaha, siyaha or traveling. Now, uh, this, is, this is not siyaha going to, I don't know, south of France or going to Blackpool. It's siyaha in the spiritual sense. You have to be prepared to move physically as well as, as, well as uh, uh, mentally and particularly spiritually. Assuming you all have that, <laughs> inshallah you do. Then you can go into the manazil, and the first, you would then, I believe, be at the stage at which the, the pupils or the adepts or the companions of the Khawaja and other great beings of the past were at. And this is addressed to them at this stage of where they have found their guidance, they have found their inquiry, they are aware, they are agitated, and they are now traveling. And here, at this point, the, the, the traveler becomes the seeker, and then the seeker becomes the wayfarer. The, the, first, the first stage of the Khawaja's uh, manazil is what he calls the stage of the beginnings. Uh, the book is written in Arabic, by the way, which is, uh, he wrote both in Arabic and in Farsi, and he wrote also some wonderful uh, poems and uh, supplications. The most famous one is called uh, Munajat. This is written in, in, in Persian. But this this is one of his 
most important works in Arabic, Manazil al-Sayreen. And the stage of the, the first stage, that, imagine talking in a room like this uh, a thousand years ago to, to a group such as yourselves. Uh, he, would, he would start with the stage of the beginnings. And the, the, the stage of the beginnings is, he divided that, as I said, each stage has ten doors. So we are in stage one, door one. Door one, he calls it the door of awakening, or yaqba. And he goes to, to explain uh, what he means by that. And that moves into the door of recognition of error, which is uh, the door of uh, tawbah, that is seeking Tawbah is not really for seeking forgiveness. Uh, Tawbah Yatubu has that, has that attribute, but it's also uh, a, a form of recognizing that you need to change your, your, your ways, your, at least your spiritual ways. And from the door of recognizing error, he moves into the door of accountability. That is, you, we have to develop within ourselves the capacity to account for, for our actions in a spiritual sense. And the, this, this sense of accountability also is, is it's a kind of built-in uh, safeguard for either transgressing or moving beyond what is the permissible medium way, the way, the golden mean, as it were. And there are various doors I, I will I will describe now in very short before I go to the to the third stage, which is the heart of, of the talk today. And he goes through the, the fourth door of stage one is the door of deputizing your affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to reality or truth or to God. And he calls that the door of inada, where you you basically uh, s- submit your will to a much greater will. You, you bend it to that will. And you deputize your affairs to, to one who, who, who is, is the master of the affair itself. So the act of deputization or the act of inabla uh, is a recognition that uh, you, are, you want to hand over the management of your affairs to a higher authority. Uh, it's very and very imperfectly. It's like handing over your political affairs to an MP, but uh, Allah is not an MP. <laughs> so it is, it is that sense of of delegation, of transfer, of responsibility. And then that he talks then about mo- that moves through the door of reflection through the door of uh, remembrance, through the door of steadfastness. I'm just going very fast with them. Uh, the door of, of abandonment, the door of spiritual exercises, and finally the door of uh, uh, listening that is developing the sight, the, the, the inner capacity to listen to sounds and to vibrations that have within them uh, huge symbolic and ritualistic significance. Of course, the greatest audition is to listen to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His second stage, second manazil, is, the, is what he calls the manazil of the abwab, that is the gateways to the spiritual world. And again, he divides them into, into ten conditions, ten uh, states of, of spiritual being, the state of sorrow, Mainly sorrow at 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 what what has what you did not do when you could have done. It's not sorrow in the sense of regret, but that you have lost some. It's something that you know you can recapture, but you know that in the time allotted to you, you have spent too much away from from the need to to anchor your your being in the recognition that the affair belongs to Allah Subhanahu. Uh, alert apprehension, concern, humility, quietening of the person, self-discipline, spiritual ardor, and then a kind of male and inclination that you want to continue on this journey. And this is when the true uh, 
the true stage what, of, of the, the, begin, the beginning of the wayfarer. So far, as I said, you, you've moved from being a traveler to being a seeker, and now you are a true wayfarer. And this is the beginning of the story, so we shall talk about it, inshallah, in greater detail. This is the stage at which the adept or the, the murid or the salik or whatever you like to call him or her is now firmly on, on the path of inner realization and now wants to deal. Now, there are two levels of dealing, actually three levels of dealing. You deal, first of all, with the outer world. The next set of dealings is with yourself. It's the, the dialogue between soul and self, between that inner reality, that inner light that is within you, and the self which has the ability to move from being the most base, the most uh, uh, common, to the most luminous, the most spiritual. And the third set of dealings, of course, is with, with reality itself, is with the haq, with Allah, with God. This, the, the, uh, the master, uh, every time he moves to a stage, he has a kind of introductory uh, explanation for it. And here I put the introductory explanation in red. I mean, I've translated, this is uh, verbatim from, from, from the Khawaja. And I put my, my, my own commentary there. The, the stage where the, the adept is at the stage of dealings or of transaction. The purpose of this stage is to basically nurture the inner qualities that, that govern the wayfarer in his or her dealings with, with the world that is beginning to open up. This is the world, the world of the unseen, the world of subtle realities, the world of, of things that are qualitative rather than quantitative, the world where matter recedes and, and meanings emerge, forms go away, the outer forms of things melt, and their inner meanings begin to emerge. And the stage of mu'amalat or transactions is how do, you, how do you deal with the inner meanings? So, and it starts really where all things start. It starts with yourself, the self itself, the nafs. How do you this nafs which has moved from, from suddenly waking up that there's a, this universe out there, this realm out there. How do you nurture it? How do you, how do you uh, groom it so that it can deal with a subtler world? It's like, think, think of it in terms of a baby learning to walk or a, a child uh, who has moved from being, being weaned from, uh, from uh, uh, liquids to solid food. Where we really, it's not that much different. I mean, we are learning now how to deal with a world that is that is uh, that has different parameters, different rules, different shades than the outer world. So when we see when we say that a child needs to be groomed, we also need to groom ourselves when we are dealing with a with a world or the universe that has a completely different uh, access to the one that we are used to. And that is, as a child or as an, as, a, as an adolescent or a youth or an adult learns to deal with the, with the demands of the outer world, you have to learn to deal with the demands of the inner world. And these, again, have, have stages and steps. You can't immediately you know, give a, a one-year-old a beef steak. I mean, you know what to do with it. The same thing, you can't really jump to you jump these stages. You have to be true to yourself. So the, the core of all of this is the self. How the self that has suddenly awoken, suddenly is aware, suddenly is, knows that there's a universe out there that's different. How do you come to terms with it? And I think really it's important that we, we ourselves acknowledge that maybe sometimes we jump in the deep end you have to understand that the, out, that the outer world cannot be a way into the inner world by itself. It's, I've seen many cases where people 
complain or or they 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 exclaim that their that their outer worship has not really given them this kind of it may give them a sort of small spiritual high, but it's not sustainable. What you want to do is to sustain it, to continue it, to maintain it, and to grow with it. And therefore, I think you have to go through these. You have to be be true to yourself, because you you're now embarking on it, and you you want to take this this small charge and make sure it it it, uh, it grows to its proper potential rather than snuff it out at the beginning and here the the way to do it the 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 key to transacting successfully with the unseen assuming you have the taste for it not everybody has a taste for it or everybody has a desire to know what this realm is all about <clears throat> the key to that, I think, is what what I would call refining virtues. Now, virtues is, is, is a heavy word sometimes. You know, it's, it's like piety. You know, it can it can it can be too cumbersome and burdensome and so on. But virtues are really once they become the virtues of the inner way, it's like the courtesy or the adab of dealing. And this once once you have the courtesy of dealing with with the signs and signals that come from 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 the unseen. Of course, the, I'm taking it as a prima facie case. That <coughs> we all have to believe in the unseen; otherwise, you shouldn't be here. I mean, the unseen is the is the heart of, of the Quran. It's the Quran is written for any spiritual book. In fact, is written to those who believe in the unseen. <laughs> If you don't, it doesn't make much sense to 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 try to uh, understand the unseen simply by constant repetition. So, stage one in this process of transacting is, according to the Khawaja, it's what he calls riaya. I've, I've translated it as giving due. He always starts with a Quranic Quranic. Uh, uh, Ayah, or parts of an ayah. And here he quotes from, from uh, Surah 57, Ayah 27, but they did not give it, that's Allah's pleasure, justice. Uh, I've translated it again in, in red here, uh, and my own commentary is in black. What, what does, what does ri'ayah mean? What does giving due mean? Giving due to others from a spiritual sense. The ayat al as you say, the other in Arabic, is to understand that they share with you immutable quality. He or she may be the most despicable person on earth. Maybe all, all horrible things can be attributed to him or her. But he, sh- he or she share with you that immutable quality, now, which is the soul. So... Whenever you, when you're in this stage, when you've reached the third stage of, of the stage of transactions, when you see the other in its outer form, give, you have to give due to them, you have, that they share with you these immutable, uh, immutable qualities. And you see their actions in two ways. Their actions that are driven by their self, but their actions behind which is the only actor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the truth, or reality, or haq, or the Rahman, as Allah calls himself, the merciful. Giving duty, as I said, there are three levels. One is the outer, one is to yourself, and one is to reality, or to Allah. Giving due to yourself is to know that yourself has, has a spectrum that it has a spectrum, it has a potential. If you don't know, if you don't believe that yourself has a potential to rise to the highest levels, then why are you doing this? You therefore must believe that these these qualities are within you. They're not. You may. They, they may not be noticeable now. They may not be discernible now. But they're there, and therefore, courtesy. Ra'aya of yourself is to 
basically glorify yourself. Now, that doesn't mean sort of go around beating your chest and saying how great you are like Tarzan, but you have to say that, you know, you have within you a nafs al nafs al mutma'inna, a nafs al raviyah, a nafs al mardiyah. And that self is a very luminous and a very precious, very precious quality. Of course, the final stage in giving due to things is that you give due to to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, to the haqq, to, to the truth, is that behind all of that, behind self, behind all your states and conditions, desires and wants, is the inexpressible one. Once you are able to do that instinctively, without even even dwelling on it, you have passed uh, the test for uh, the door, the door of Raya, you pass through it, and then you move to the next door, which is the door of Muraqaba, which is watchfulness. And again, the, the Khawaja course from the Quran, uh, and be watchful. I can read it in Arabic if, if somebody has the Quran here. Yeah, uh, I'll read the translation in English. If there's a Quran, I'll read in Arabic. Uh, and be watchful, for they are surely watched. Maybe Luqman, you can tell us. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فارتقب إنهم مرتقبون صدق الله العظيم and be watchful for they are surely watched again the red is, is the khawadah's uh, uh, verbatim translation the reason why I'm not dwelling on his uh, on his because it is written as I said in, in the 11th century language and it's somewhat uh, jarring to modern ears so my commentary is a commentary on that. What is watchfulness, according to the Khawaja, and also with my own twist here onto it? <clears throat> I say that watchfulness of the heart, muraqabat al qalb, when you watch your inner being, it must lead to a sense of tranquility and serenity that you are in the presence of, of al-azal, of what is eternal. And this, by, by constantly watching for these signs, for the signs of eternity, for the signs of azaliya in you, you yourself become secure and in the knowledge that eternity is there. And when you see these flashes of the eternal within you, it, it, makes, it makes you uh, extremely tranquil because, and, and sure and certain. So muraqaba is not, not simply you know, spying on yourself, as it were, and taking a metaphorical uh, ruler on beating yourself with it. No, it is, you have to, it's not watching for transgressions, <coughs> as much as watching for the flashes and the signs of the eternal. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm sure you must have had these flashes. Sometimes some extraordinary set of events takes place. And they suddenly, you know that, that the, the signs, this is one of the signs, one of the clear, clear signals. So it's like a person, uh, I suppose, and uh, just before a, a, a dark and stormy night, you take out uh, your binoculars, watching for the lightning to strike. And when you see it, you become even more confirmed. That door opens to the third door. That that room, the room of watchfulness, Morocco, that opens once you've 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 mapped out its contours. You follow into the next room what he calls the room of hurma or safeguarding I've translated as safeguarding limits and the Quranic ayah that he uses here is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim 
ذلك ومن يعظم حرمات الله فهو خير له عند ربي translated and the one who safeguards the limits set by Allah he or she is the one who is assured of goodness with his Lord here this is I think is one of the most difficult conditions for modern wayfarers because it, it requires that you accept limits part paradoxically part of inner freedom is to understand that there are outer limits and their outer boundaries. And because we, th- we tend to think of freedom as an absence of restrictions, as absence of, of any constraints, when you're asked to constrain yourself and to bound yourself, it's like, uh, it seems to be counterintuitive. It's like, you know, skiing. When you want to stop, usually you go back. I think so. But today, <laughs> you have to stop going forward. So it's, it's against your natural instinct to feel that out of, where out of freedom means removal of chains and so on, that you need to put them in order for you to be free. But the self needs to be contained. There's no question about that. The self is not the soul. Self mirrors the soul and wants to mimic it. And I'm here quoting Sheikh Fadlallah. But in this case, in this, in this instance, there is, there is no doubt that the, the act of containment, the act of, of trying to uh, accept that there are limits to your conduct, and these limits allow you to channel your energies, is essential. Because they channel your energies, ultimately, towards the one. It's by putting boundaries, this, this flow that this effulgence that you have at this stage uh, is not wasted, is not dissipated. You don't want to be, as they call them, majloops, people who are just attracted by a magnetic force. You want to channel it so that it's, 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 it can ha- have maximum effect rather than dissipated. And that's why many people, uh, I'm afraid, at this point, the self rebels and does not necessarily uh, commit. Discipline is essential. And as I earlier said, you have to select a path. The selection of the path is essential. Of course, I, I will always promote the path of Islam. But the path of any, any deen hanif, any primordial religion says the same thing. The containment of the outer uh, limits are absolutely necessary. And with the containment of the outer limits, you end up with, with, with a kind of interweaving with your inner reality. And it is, it is the forms, for example, of the ritual prayers that Islam and other religions have other primordial religions uh, are really to do with these with with willingly and then joyfully accepting limits because if you see for example your salat in terms of a dialogue and a dialogue with 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 the, with the one and a process of yielding to the reality that of that one then the, the, the nature of that limit becomes limitless as you begin to approximate the divine presence. I use the other example of the Hajj. I mean, the, the Hajj, it, you can go on Hajj every year, but if you don't have a sense of the sacred space that you're going into, if you don't have a sense that there, there is what is known as the axis mundi, that is the, that this is the central point of physical creation where the outer world meets with the inner world. Then it becomes a kind of religious tourism. And I'm sure it's very good for the economy and very good for you and so on. But the, that, the, for the, for the, for the wayfarer, uh, 
th that, that knowledge is lost if you don't connect the, that outer ritual to its inner reality. And fasting, uh, and of course, I think one of the most powerful of the outer constraints is zakat, because you're giving something that is dear to you, and that's very unnatural. Uh, fasting, in, in, in some ways, is, is basically it's an inversion of the outer senses to a heightening of the inner senses, and so on. So this this stage, the stage of of uh, accepting limits, is a very it's it's a very large room, and it's one in which many people uh, their, their self rebels, or at least limits it to its outer form. Once we have mastered this 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 uh, room or this door, we go to the next next gate, which is the gate of class or sincerity. And here, the Khawaja quotes: "To Allah belongs the sincere religion." Uh, I've I've. Sincere in Arabic means both sincerity as the way it, what it means in English. It also means unvarnished. Something Zahab Khalis is un, uh, has no, no, it is unadulterated. So it can be both sincerity in the sense of being uh, uh, constant in your loyalty or in your, in your exclamations. But it can also mean unadulterated. So I think the the second definition is probably more more uh, more precise here. But in the Quran as in everything you know, in the Quran is that it can be either or and both are true. So if you think of therefore as class as a form of removing anything that that uh, distorts, pollutes, uh, makes impure, as well as being a form of loyal consistency, I think you would be you would be on the right right path. Here what so what does sincerity in transactions and dealings mean? I mean in the outer form obviously it means that you have to be consistent in what you say, you have to be you have to be sure of what you say, you have to be prepared to continue and in, in, in sustaining that but in, in inner spiritual work what does that mean? I mean ikhlas to your inner transactions what, what uh, above all it means that the transaction itself or the effort that you're exerting or the work that you're doing it's, it's not something that uh, you, you, you have to shed the notion that this work needs to be in one way or another recognized or in one, one way or another uh, noted or rewarded because an important element of transacting with ikhlas, with sincerity is to know that your effort and your exertions are really reflections of something else. They are not your you may be acting, you may be doing, but behind it all is the, the, the enabler, the grantor of power, the grantor of your capacity to work. And that everything that drives you in your spiritual work has to be based on that knowledge and recognition, constant recognition, that outer work and inner work only leads you to understand that work itself, effort itself, is one of the attributes of uh, uh, of, of the divine, of divinity, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, sincerity is to yield 
as it were, to the patterns and flows that are established by this fact. So to, to the sincere wayfarer, the outcomes of your work are really independent of the, the exertions that you put in. You can exert yourself for as much as you want, but the outcome is, is not in your, in, your, in your hand to manage. So sincerity is sincerity to that knowledge, truth of that knowledge, that this is the unvarnished truth. Then we come to the fifth, the fifth stage, which is the stage of refinement or tahbib. And here it is to ensure that refinement is in many ways the, the notion that your spiritual works, your dealings at the spiritual level do not become habitual and repetitive. And in fact, uh, this is this is repeated much or said much earlier by uh, by Imam Ali himself. He said that the bane of all spiritual exercises and their their inability to uplift you is when they become habitual. You have to, of course, be constrained by the bounds. You have to constrain. Be, be you have to accept that your conduct is contained. But this outer can. Outer containment is a reflection of your of your of your uh, inner abandonment. So every act that you have must, in itself, have within it within it, within it the courtesy of 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 being uh, consistent, of being truthful, of being reflective of the reality that that behind it all is, is the one. And in that way, it will become ever fresh ever, ever uh, uplifting. Then we come to the stage or the, 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 the door of uprightness or istiqama, what he calls istiqama. And istiqama, of course, in the outer forms mean that you, you become upright, you become, you become, uh, you have all the positive virtues. You, are, you, you, you deal with people sincerely, fairly, etc. But istiqama in the, in the world is, literally means to, to stand up or to move from one condition, one, one, one level of being to another. It's a kind of if moving from lying down to standing up. The spiritual meaning of lying down to, to standing up is to move from knowledge of what is not real to what is only real. What You move from what is other than reality to reality itself. And this is the, the, the process of rising spiritually, is in fact what uprightness constitutes in the inner dimension. The uprightness of people, as I said, in the outer world is to abide by the rules and guidelines of the way. It's the way of, of moderation, it's the way of economy, it's the way of balance. But as the reality begins to unfold in its, in its, in its magnificence, in its totality, the, your vision moves to, from, from what is close and near to the far and further horizons. So a vista opens up for you. It's, it's, it's like a metaphorical standing up. So it's like we're lying down and suddenly we wake, we stand up and we see in front of us a vista. We see in front of us a, an entire panorama. And that this is the uprightness of, of the spiritual warfare. It is, it's, 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 a, it's a scene, somebody compared it to a scene of a, of a, a person who is is about to drown and his head pops up and suddenly he sees a mag magnificent vista, a magnificent island and he knows he can reach it. So think of yourself as, as suspended in this limitless ocean and your head pops up and you suddenly see all of this in front of you. And it's, it's, a, 
it's a scene that is, I mean, it, it puts to, you know, you go up to the Swiss Alps and you see in front of you these magnificent vistas. The reality of the inner world is is much more alpine <laughs> than, than you will see in Switzerland. The glimpses, if you have glimpses of that, that's sufficient to know that it's there. We now come to another very common uh, theme that appears, especially for people, on, they talk about tawakkul uh, or reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many Quranic ayahs that refer to that. Tawakkul and the reliance in the inner sense is again different from uh, from from the outer. And it is a very difficult state to be in and to sustain. The reason why is because when you are truly reliant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are you are denying the you're refusing to accept or you're denying the universality of cause and effect. We, are, we live in a material world. We live in a physical world. Every single experience that we've had in the outer world is to do with cause and effect. Everything. Everything has a, has a cause and, and there seems to be an effect after that. And our knowledge of the world is really determined by these laws, the laws of causality. And the, we are trapped in it. We are we are entwined in it. And to accept that there is another set of laws beyond the physical, mental, and psychological that is as real, as important, as significant is absolutely essential. And this is what tawakkul is. Tawakkul is not to sort of go to an exam and write on top that, you know, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, although you should do that, but, or do something, you expect an outcome and you say, Tawakkal to Allah, I, 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 I rely. It's not that. It's to confirm, verify that the inner world has a different law and that the outer world is only an act of Allah as a designer, al-musawwar. He has given the outer world a set of laws. He has given also the inner world. He's also the musawwar of the inner world, the fashioner and the designer of the inner world. But if you're trapped in time and space, what can you see as being anything else as being true? That's why it's extremely, extremely difficult. And for you to be in tawakkul is really a huge, huge escape. I call it the escape from the prison of causality. It's like running away from, from, from a world that you know is not complete in its own, in its own form. But of course, you don't want to fall into another pit, which is a pit of fatalism. You know, everything is in the hands of Allah, therefore your actions are meaningless. That's not true. Your actions are necessary. Their outcomes are not, are not up to you. So tawakkul or reliance demands that human beings act in the moment with full vigor and full knowledge. But know that the outcome is really in the hands of, of another power. And if you start defining outcomes in terms of either expansion or contraction, favorable or unfavorable, increase or decrease, you're also rendering your sense of your statement that you're relying on, on the truth, on, on Allah, as being uh, insufficient. Because outcomes are... If you think you are you cause you are you are the cause and you are responsible for the outcome, these outcomes are are really imposters if you attribute them to other than the acts of reality. So in truth there's only one actor 
one decider. And that's the highest level of knowledge of the, in the as it were, in the, in the realm of tawakkul. If you are true tawakkul in its highest, most refined, most pristine sense, is a, a, a knowledge and verification that there's only one actor, one decider. According to the Khawaja, and, and I agree with it, uh, I think, is that more important than tawakkul, which many people who are spiritually minded think that by relying, uh, you have, you've reached the highest possible. That's not, there's another stage, which is he calls the stage of tafwil or uh, delegation. When you delegate your affair to the great reality, to the great truth, to the haq, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're delegating your powers of, of action and decision before the event. In tawakkul, you're doing it after a cause has appeared. So delegation, when you hand over your entire uh, your entire affair, as it were, your entire matter, to reality, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before anything happens, is, in my mind, a higher station than to rely on, uh, on reality after something has happened. So it precedes the cause rather than comes after it. Because there also you see the hand of the creator behind the cause, not only behind the effect. This is, this is a much nobler station to be in, a much higher station. Usually we want to control outcomes. We want to have outcomes that bend to our desires and wills. But it requires more subtlety to see that reality is also truth is also behind the cause and if you are if you are able to see that if you are able to see that it is both cause and effect these two imposters really are only just uh, manifestations of, of uh, the creator of the cause and the fashioner of the effect then you are you are in at a at a high high station, and I think it's very extraordinary and it's very rare. I must I cannot be a judge of people, but what I can see from people's actions and behavior, it's very very rare to see a person who has uh, done this delegation tough wheel, where both cause and beyond the 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 tongue this has to be a, a state that settles on the, on the heart itself I've seen maybe two people like that maybe three two certainly where the cause and effect is, is, is to them is just just indifferent Indifference, by the way, is, a, is, is not indifference like when you see a car wreck in front of you, you don't go and help people. That's, I don't mean that kind of indifference. Is that when you are balanced between, twixt the two, as Shakespeare says. Uh, once we have tough wheel, which is a very rare occasion, and I've seen maybe in my life, 50,000 people, so <laughs> two out of 50,000 is a very rare occurrence. We move to uh, the next uh, room, which is or the next bad, the door of uh, confidence or thought. Here, of course, the greatest example uh, in the Quran is the serenity of confidence that comes from acting with with a with an empty heart and here uh, this 
the ayah, uh, I said that Qasim in the void actually should be in the river. It's a mistake. Uh, it refers to uh, uh, Nabi Allah Musa, uh, Islam, his mother, who cast him in, into the river. And she was instructed to do so only when her innermost heart was settled, was tranquil. And that, the confidence that that comes from, from that condition gave Moses' mother the, the serenity to put her child into the, into the river. And here there is a hadith Qudsi which I came across. Also the, the Khawaja talks about it. And it says, O oh man, you might will, and I will, but naught will be except what I will. It's this confidence that, 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 that you know that, that your will is, is pales into really nothingness when you set it against the will of the one. And confidence, of course, bashes, banishes doubt and uncertainty in all of your spiritual actions and lead, leads to those who are most realized uh, to the abandonment of means, any means, as a way to the end. And we come to the last door of the, the, the gate to the stage of transactions, which is the door of uh, Bab al-Taslim, or the yielding and surrender. The most, the most commendable, of course it's commendable to know, to yield to the demands and decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's commendable, uh, no question about that. But it's much more uh, subtle to know that yielding itself, the power to yield, comes from elsewhere. It's a power granted us to yield to Him. So, when you yield and you're proud of your yielding, the act of yielding itself is a power granted to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by reality. In fact, all around you are signs of, of majesty, <coughs> of beauty, of power. So when you say, I'm going to yield a salim wajhi or I'm going to surrender my will. You must also know that the power for you to surrender is granted to you as a gift. So the highest stage of yielding is to know that yielding itself is an imposter because the, the power that gives you the yielding is granting you the, that ability to, rec to, to surrender uh, to him. And it's, of course, it's a, this, is, this is the last day station of this stage. And it is, I think, a very perilous one because it actually denudes from you all sense that yourself is able to do anything uh, without what is given to you, uh, what, what in Arabic calls iktisab, something that is granted to you. So the power to think, the power to reflect, the power to, to yield, the power to breathe, the power to memorize, the power, all these powers are granted to you. And the highest stage of yielding is to in fact be effaced from yielding. It's paradoxical, but you have to submit to it and then submit to the submission. And then you move on to the next uh, stage, inshallah, to be continued. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
No, I will keep you um, tender. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm assuming all of you will, will, will see where the perils are and go around them. But all of you have to be true to yourselves. I mean, you have to decide where you are on the scale. Maybe this is too, 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 too advanced or too, uh, too uh, juvenile. Who knows? You have to decide. But don't forget, this is not a m outer manual. This is to do with safeguarding, developing, enhancing, refining your inner condition. And th these are... Think of yourself as a person who is learning a new language, learning how to deal in a new world, Think of yourself in the outer form. If you, somebody deposits you on Mars, you know, how would you deal with that? This is a this is an inner Mars. It's not a Mars. It's a cosmos. Now, it, you will find your own way. There's no there's no there's no unlike the outer world where you have you have people who can uh, guide you all the time and direct you and make sure you don't fall and break your your teeth when you're or in in the inner world, the, the, the need for a guide, we understand, discipline, we all know that, but the work is yours. It's, you have to work on yourself. It's not something that, that is uh, it's essential to have all the other uh, 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 accompaniments. Essential. You can, I don't think you can go on without a guide. It's impossible. And this is many people drop at this stage, you know. Why does he know more than I do? Who does who does she think she is? Many people also drop out at 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 these various points where the self is not prepared to not to just physically put your put your uh, brow on the on the ground, but to to actually bend yourself. People drop out there. So there's various kinds of dropouts. At the end, you know, who knows? It's like you know the conference of the birds, where what thirty thousand birds start, and only thirty end. At the end. But uh, so, you, you're more. The more you go on, the more your guide becomes your illumined self, and the less. Of course, your 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 illumined self, like your outer self, has to be constantly nourished, and you nourish them by reflection, by remembrance, by dhikrs, by a salat, in its inner reality. Because all awareness has to come very early, Nasi, very early. That, that, that's actually, I'm still stuck at that very that sentence that you said about, you know, where you're agitated and I think that it's from that agitation but you really have to look very deeply at that and we don't because we we just want to push that agitation away so there has to you know it's like saying that the trust and all of that has to be there to a certain degree anyway for you to be able to kind of examine any of it because at those early stages we just don't we all we want to do is to push away from that Agitation, but it's that thing that takes you to it as well. I mean, it's an agitation that is that is. Uh, I mean, has a has a sweetness to it. It's not a. It's not something that you know, makes you constantly you know, pull your shirt like that. It's not something that causes you to. It's something that you want to quench, yeah. to quell. But that is, again, I'm, I'm, you have to go through these stages in order to bring yourself to the point where uh, those of, of who lived in a more in a world where the sacred was more was more evident in their daily lives. It's very very difficult to to uh, to discover to have a supportive outer environment. Very difficult. 
there's nowhere, I mean, east, west, all the same. I, mean, I don't say east is worse or better or west is better or worse. It's all the same. And it, dis it distorts reality because it, it uh, privileges the, the material, the, what is quantitative. Uh, it privileges the this causality. That, and, and people always drop out from there because uh, they 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 cannot establish the same degree of certainty about the inner world that they have with the outer world. I mean, th at the end of the day, what you have to think of should happen here is that the like you you take the law of gravity as instinctive. I mean, if you throw an apple in there, it's going to fall down. You don't think about it. You have to be at that, th this kind of instinctiveness, this kind of uh, sort of an automatic, intuitive response, uh, is a, a condition that, is, that is, uh, is what we hope this will lead to. So, um, you know, like how he was explaining in the things of um, Master Khawaja mm -hmm. that uh, the subtleties was more clear and people, you know. Um, and so today, as you said, you know, it's more about the gross. Um, how, how, if you want to embark on this um, reality and you know, live your life, with the gross being so manifest, is there any other kind of practical advice you can give, like methodology or, or environment or things we can literally do to bring this about in our lives as well, or aid us hmm. on this journey? Well, I'm, I'm sure you know the most, I mean, the common ones of halakas and liquors and, and. But. It is a. I'm afraid a lot of this is is self work. It's it can be quite uh, uh, arduous. Can be easy. I mean, and d doors really open quite quickly if you are if you are if you if you approach them with with sincerity. They really open quickly, and it's it's not that difficult. I mean, I, c I can't claim that you know I'm completely no, but it is quite possible. For, for a, a, a serious, dedicated person, with a supportive environment, with companions, with with good guidance, the best guide is one who 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 tells you that after he he or she guides you, then that's it. It's like you become self-propelling. That's that's the best guide. What you are, what you're saying is really very very important because people want, I mean okay there's a manual the so far is theory you want practice practice comes traditionally in these various groups and circles and and, and harapas that you have maybe it's inadequate I don't know I mean you have to you have to ask yourself whether this is the the right uh, spiritual mix we, we'll get to that I hope yes so. Uh, whether, but my own feeling is that my own not, not feeling is mine. You have to work with your own, uh, your own mail, your own predilections. You must not go against that. If you if you if you respond to if your condition is enhanced, let's say, by uh, Quranic recitation, that's, that they should go in that. If it's if if it's not, but you have to read it yourself, you have to do it that way. If some are enhanced by by music, by by repetitive sounds, the, these are all techniques that uh, you have to gauge for yourself whether the, these would work. But as we go on, inshallah, they will. But I'm sure Lokman knows more about this. Thing. Don't you look one? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wonder if you can give a bit of advice about avoiding 
repetitiveness and, and someone who's Arabic is basically pretty weak. And, you know, I can only manage to learn off by heart about eight or ten, which is actually very limited, and I find I, I sing each one. And I, mean, I wonder if you would advise, you know, you, you just do your akar without any need of it, I mean, would that be kind of exceptional? Uh, I don't know how to step on anybody's toes. Obviously, if you if, if you're committed to this outer discipline, you have to do it the way it's prescribed. However, I strongly urge you to do additional what you're saying. So maybe that would you, you have to do the, the 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 ritualistic, and if it's if it doesn't have the the necessary uh, uh, elevation for you. Then you have to do the other, the other form. But, but uh, this is a, this is an issue, and I, uh, this is not the right forum maybe to talk about it. But I think uh, if you are, if you are on the path of Islam, you have to, you have to accept these, these essential rituals. But try to see their inner meanings. And uh, it's very difficult, I know, for, for. Uh, you have to learn a new language. You have to learn. You have to learn a certain structure. But these these are requirements, and uh, I'm not going to advocate that they be abandoned. On the contrary, if you choose this way of doing, if you choose this one, but I strongly urge you to add to it. To add to it, and uh, to add to it in the form of of. Uh, not in not in prescribed traditional forms. Add to it in your own way. It's a very useful in this because he goes into the deeper meaning of some of the Arabic words. It's been so helpful because once you have fight these things, they mean more to you. I mean, if you are if you are. If you want to go beyond the the ritualistic, uh, you can do it within within traditional forms, but you can also do it in non-traditional forms. I mean, there there are you 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 do your salat according to the to the rigors of that. You try to uh, instill in yourself a sense of their inner dimensions. You try to recite verses that are that are more accessible to you, but then you can add to that. I mean, it doesn't take much time uh, if you if you do it the rituals, if if you time them as if you time them as rituals, don't take much time. But if you want to squeeze them for their true meaning, then you have to either select or pre-select. The, the verses that you are going to recite within the forms that are allowed and add to them uh, the, the the other aspects I mean those who who, who read uh, 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 supplications those who read poetry those who read uh, Rumi or whatever these are all very very powerful additional tools but when I said at the beginning you have to select a path you have to select a path, and I think you have to stay within the terms, the rules of that path. Now, maybe the rules maybe may need to be changed at some point, but I'm not going to change that. Others will have to do that. I said the last question. So Sorry. The last one. <laughs> you want to have really something important to ask, otherwise I'll... I mean, what? Why do we have to pray in Arabic at all? I mean, the, the one reason why I always justify it is it acts as kind of an icebreaker yeah. to learn Arabic. So that when you read the Quran afterwards, you don't, you're not relying on other people's tafsir all the time. Because sometimes you pick up some scholar's tafsir and you, and you just think to yourself, that doesn't mean that at all, and even check it in the dictionary. And what they've referred to is the sixth meaning in the list mm. of, of meanings of a particular word, and why not the first five? Well, why do... I mean, this is how I justify it for myself. But how do other people then, how, how can we expect like Japanese people or Europeans or people who have no contact with, with, with the Arab world whatsoever to learn Arabic and then pray in that language as well? 
Well, because if you think of Arabic as my language or the language of those who speak Arabic, I think you are you are right. But if if you think of Arabic as a sacred language, as one of the languages because of the structure, because of its form, then I don't think you're right. Because the sacred Arabic is not the spoken Arabic. It is a way in which human beings dialogue with the unseen. Now, there are, there are other traditions that use different languages. But we, we believe, I believe, that this is the most perfected form of the primordial religion. So if you, if you find, if you're convinced that there are other paths that are equally valid and that reflect this, this original deen, the original religion, then by all means. But if, you, if you're going to choose Islam, one of the conditions of, of that choice is the choice of the language. So think of Arabic as a, as a, a kind of, uh, I don't know, it's like, it's not a machine language, but it's, it's a language that lends itself to understanding the subtler realities. Now, you say that your, the way that your mind is wired, the way that you use language, uh, European language, are different structurally. Yes, they are. But so is modern Arabic from this side. I mean, I have no natural... I have some advantage over you because I can maybe read the script more easily. Uh, I can speak Arabic too. Fantastic. I'm, to yeah. I'm not, I'm yeah. not complaining. Yeah. That, uh, okay. that I'm, I, I just feel sorry for okay. Europeans or for anybody else. I do too. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. Suddenly yeah. uh, asked to pray in that language yeah. and you say it's a sacred language. Yeah, maybe for us because we understand it. But, yeah. but what about... But for, if some, sorry. Sorry, it has to do with the frequency, isn't it? That, the, the, that, that Arabic that we're talking about, that there's a whole realm, isn't that? It, doesn't it come from another realm? And isn't it no, I mean, it's, it's a tradition. I mean, as I said before, you, you, have to sele- you have to agree with me that you have to select a path, unless you want to start your own path. Right? So you, you select this path. This path has certain, any body of traditional knowledge has certain requirements built into it. Now, you have to accept that this is the way it goes. Now, it, does, it may not make sense, in which case, if it does not open up to you the vistas that I'm talking about, then obviously Arabic is, is, a, is an issue here. I personally don't think that uh, if you make a choice that, uh, that this is the, the part that is most proximate or is the most or the least adulterated of the parts in its present form, not in its original form. Then I think you have to make a you have to make a commitment to understanding the subtler meanings of the language. Now I I don't want to compare Christianity and Latin, right? but Latin also is a language that is that was not spoken, but it's a way in which the spiritual tradition of Christendom was expressed in the Middle Ages. I cannot see how how you can get around Arabic in its in its uh, in its uh, in its sacred form. It's it's not that uh, it's not that onerous to repeat a certain set of words. Now, if the, the words maybe the repetition of the words, the way that the words sound to you, uh, may play a part in in in, in raising your your as it were, your spiritual consciousness. But if it doesn't, I don't. I really don't know what to say. I mean, to I mean, to me, to me, it is something that is that is taken for granted. Yeah. I mean, maybe a way around it is just simply, if you, as a European or a Japanese person, for example, if you take certain surahs that you recite in your prayers, and and instead of focusing on the on the word that you're reciting, to prevent it becoming habitual. You just remember the, the translation of it, and you just recite it, and, and your mind works on two levels. One way you're doing the thing, and the other way you're thinking of, of uh, the meaning that you've memorized from the English translation. Maybe that's how you can focus a bit more than that. Yes, sir. Habitual. Or maybe you should read the, maybe you should read the, the, mm. you know, the verses before you do your salat. Mm. Read the translation. Select a verse, mm. a short one, uh, and read it, read it carefully understand it, and then do your salah. Mm-hmm. Or do it afterwards. But uh, it, I have to admit, it is, it is 
something that the modern mind does not accept. I mean, in the past, people accepted it and made the effort, and they absorbed it and imbibed it and took it more further. I mean, the Arabs were responsible for the for the for the for the deen, as it were, for a very short period of time. And other other races and other nations took it took it on, mm. and it became becomes a universal language. Uh, in its sacred form. So, I mean, look, trying trying to see how this message unfolds in time. The Arabs are responsible for maybe a hundred years. And then other people came came on the scene. So it is it is, you know, something by its very nature, not not Arabic, but Islam and the 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 Quranic experience phenomenon by its very nature seeps out of racial and ethnic and, and national. Otherwise, it would not have spread to all this. So I, it then came to a stop, I think, it was put for, a, for a variety of reasons. What you need to do at the spiritual level is to connect with the sacred Arabic, try to enhance your condition, and to take it as a core, Expand it by, as, as I said, reading some of the passages beforehand, reading some afterwards, adding to it after you do the ritual forms, adding to it uh, uh, other uh, sort of insightful experiences by by masters of the time, doing remembrance, which does not have to be done in Arabic, uh, and so on. So it's it's a it's a whole whole. Uh, universe out there of possibilities, and this is this is the work not for the for the for the for the average person. This is for people who have the taste for it. Man, what do you say for regarding the Arabic side? Uh, well, uh, how would you say that? Um, just as we had to pray towards Mecca, to the Kaaba, to the Qibla, spatial Qibla, uh, Arabic is the linguistic. designated as, as the you know as the medium for transmission of isn't and also like how doctors communicate with another from different sorry mind talking too much. No 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 I'd like to know how, <laughs> so, how, they, how, they so how doctors with from it's... different parts of the world yes. communicate with each other through Latin, you know. Whether it's yes, about yes. terminology. Maybe that's the way how Arabic can help um, scholars from different countries, you know, communicate. I mean, it's formidable when you see this entire universe of language and so on, and you have different grammar, different syntax, different, but the Quranic Arabic, we keep on saying that. There's not more than a few hundred words that, that need to be picked up. But uh, how, how can you recite words that are not fully intelligible in their outer meaning as a way of enhancing your spiritual state uh, is, is is something that you have to contend with. In the past, the various nations and, and language groups and so on acknowledged and accepted that this is part of their 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 spiritual education. Now, modern man might reject that, or people are not exposed to that. Might reject that there is a need for this discipline. But I think you have to you have to understand your your starting point has to be the, the 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 courtesy that you have to the sacredness of the text. If you don't have that, then I think it's very difficult to relate to the text. <coughs> you, you have to you have to believe that this text is an effulgence and is revelatory, and you approach it with that. And if it if it should then confirm itself to you. And if it is an if it is a revelatory text, if it is a text that is that is uh, an effulgence from the unseen, it takes a few more weeks, months to learn the words, why not? I mean it's wonderful. A billion people have, have non Arab speakers have accepted this. Can do is read 
short verses in advance, understand them, and you can hold what are when you are praying and read them. So it doesn't become a pillow for You can hold Quran and read it as well. And you previously understood it, you understood what it meant. So maybe that well, I'll say it since you said it. This is what I do, and uh, th- that in this, when you read, you can. It says you need to read it. You don't have to memorize it. So you can read the bilingual version. Well, obviously, it'd be very heavy, but try to get one slightly light. And uh, I think, from a from a shara point of view, this is acceptable. Look, man, is it not? What to actually read? The form of the no. Yeah. It the form of the no, it doesn't. But obviously, uh, you, you have to hold it. Yeah. I've had many scholars say it's okay, no? Because mm. how would you expect to I asked, to I learn be- this song by heart? No? Before I did, before I, I asked the scholar, but even if he told me no, I'd have done it. Because I think, uh, <laughs> I know it's a correct way. It says, Aqra. It doesn't, it's, which is different from memorizing. Obviously, if you memorize, much better. But uh, to to go through the ever fresh nature of the Quran, and believe me, you can get enormous insights if you read. Of course, you you have to read in one case full surahs, mm-hmm. and in some cases you can read ayahs. So make sure you don't start with Surah Al-Baqarah and take you seven hours. <laughs> that would be <laughs> It depends on your sect. Uh, is it, uh, yes. I mean, mm. yes, but uh, in, in, in the sec- in the third, fourth rock eyes, we don't know. But uh, some of the other sects say you can read eyes, full eyes. Even in the Jaffe school, there's there's opinion that you can read Quran. It's, it's, mm. it's, it's a popular view that you have to read uh, When I say you have to select a, a path, I meant you have to select a, a spiritual tradition, not necessarily its subtexts. <laughs> so. Okay, so we need it. You just said you can either read full or, or part of a surah, and that is the difference of opinion. Within the allowing mm. reading a part of part of part of part of part of surah. Yeah. But this is quite this is quite essential. I mean, how how can something like this have been left out here by the imams. How, how come there's differences of opinion between scholars on this issue? Well, the predominant view is really the whole surah, but I have, oh. I mean, Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid Allah, for instance, was very clear about okay. that Okay, so it's are, only a certain scholars who hold that opinion then? Yeah, but the majority of today's scholars do say you have to be the whole surah. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Advisable to do that. Hmm. Can I make a suggestion? And uh, it's really interesting uh, topic of conversation, which I think we can continue mm. in a little while. Uh, but what I suggest is if we have a five-minute break, and then inshallah, Start. Uh, Imam Luqman will, uh, will will lead us uh, uh, to the oh, second uh, zikr. Yeah. Sidi Ali, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank, thank you for sharing your treasure. Thank you. 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 Thank you.